So I'll begin with obfuscation. This is the first method of manipulation that the mind control sorcerers use against the human population. So obfuscation kind of looks like this. Um, you see an, an elaborate ornate mask here. Um, if you saw that coming at you, you might not be so uh, you know, worried about it. It seems like an ornamental style. Um, it's, this is how something has to be packaged to us. It has to look ornate, it has to look pretty, it has to um, you know, be packaged and presented to us in a, in a nice way. But if we really saw what, la what lays underneath, if we really saw what was truly coming at us, which is this, we would want to go in the opposite direction. So see, it always has to wear a mask. It has to be sold to us as something other than what it really is, so that people think it's something else. That's what obfuscation really is. And I'm going to just briefly go over what are the things that are obfuscated. How do they use obfuscation to control us mentally? Well, the sorcerers want to obfuscate simplicity with complexity. In fact, everything that I'll talk about in this presentation is quite simple, taken in and of itself. The tapestry may be ornate, it may be a lot of information to take in, but each individual component is simple, and that is because the truth is always simple. It's always easy to understand truth. Truth never comes at us with great levels of complexity. It's always something simple and elegant, just like we find in nature. So, if a controller can get you to think that discovering the truth is way too complex for you to ever look into it, they'll push you off the path because you'll say, I'm not even going to bother. It's too complex. I wouldn't possibly be able to understand it, so I'm not even going to bother to try. Okay, so that's obfuscation of simplicity with complexity. Controllers obfuscate principles with laws. Principles are based in conscience of doing the right thing because one has consciously recognized it as the right thing. Law is that which strives to create obedience based on a dynamic of fear of punishment. You're codifying something and saying, you must conform to this, you must comply to this, not because you have recognized it as such, as, as being true and as being the right thing to do, but because, in fact, you will be punished by someone if you do not conform to this or comply to it. And that modality of consciousness is based in fear. Law is based ultimately in fear consciousness, whereas principles are based in the recognition of truth and, and having conscience be born within an individual. And as such, that consciousness is based in love, embodied in a man like Gandhi, a man of principle. So the next thing that they obfuscate is dominion with fear of punishment. So this is a person who rules the kingdom of the self. They've activated the energy within them. They have united the male and female polarities, the yin and the yang, and they have raised their consciousness to a vibration of the solar mind, to the love energy dwelling within them. And they don't take actions because they fear the punishment if they don't do or do not take a certain action. They take an action because they themselves understand and have recognized that that action exists in harmony with natural law, with the natural order of the universe, with the truth. It resonates in truth. And that individual has made that recognition according to their own will and their own consciousness, not because they fear punishment. Taking that, taking an action or not taking an action because you fear punishment is the lowest level of consciousness that you can take or not take any action. You're taking it out of a vibratory energy of fear as opposed to a level of understanding that is born in love and consciousness conscience and consciousness. So 
you cannot, uh, you cannot take an action based on fear of punishment and expect there to be order and uh, peace and good things in the world. We have to make these recognitions through the raising of our own awareness that they resonate with truth and take action according to th those principles. The next thing that they obfuscate is gnosis with belief. See, gnosis can be defined as an understanding that is born through direct experience of a thing. So gnosis means you don't believe that it exists. You know that it does because you have a direct experience of that thing. So you could uh, put your hand in a pot of water and it's hot and then you have gnosis that it's hot because you actually placed your hand in the pot and you know that it is hot. Someone else, if you said, okay, that's hot, they may believe you, they may have a belief about that, they don't really have gnosis of it until they directly access it or directly experience it. So that's what gnosis is. Gnosis is knowledge born of direct experience. Belief, which is what religions want you to have, they want you to simply believe something because it is told to you by someone that came before you will put you into a modality of consciousness where you're not really thinking your own thoughts. You haven't really thought through why it is you may hold a particular belief or value. It is just something that you have acquired from someone else's understanding of the world. And that's why I say throughout this presentation, no one should believe anything that I'm saying throughout this whole presentation. It should resonate with you as truth because you looked into these things on your own and determined they are true or not true. And then live your life in harmony and in according to your understanding of that. Not because you believe what I'm saying. I'm not asking for anyone's belief. If I was asking for anyone's belief, I would be no better than any other religious leader. So I'm looking to inspire gnosis within a person. That you look into things on your own and come to your conclusions about them because you yourself have studied and considered them and know how they work. Individuality is obfuscated with culture. And this is a big one because all the value within us is carried in the individual. The individual is of ultimate value. And again, an individual is unique, a unique expression of consciousness. And culture, as the, uh, the late Terence McKenna, uh, one of my greatest mentors and teachers said, culture is not your friend, folks, he was very fond of saying. You know, it's, it's that, which is, that which controls you. It's, it's a cult, so to speak. So culture is trying to make everyone conform to its value system and its ideology about what is true and what is right. And oftentimes that's not really in harmony with the truth, with natural law, with how things really operate in the world. It's simply that way because people who came before us made it that way. And, and we're just going along with it. We don't know whether it's actually right or getting anything uh, really of great value and, and, uh, and something that can lead to our actual fulfillment out of it. We're just going along with it because others before us did it and we're expected to take up that mantle and do the same thing in culture. So it's a self-perpetuating institutionalized belief system. It's an institutional paradigm, a way of looking at the world. And that's what they try to tell you your individual identity is. It's a member of culture. Well, that isn't what your individual identity is. The true identity of the self is pure consciousness experiencing itself in, in a multitude of forms and that's where the greatest value lies within the individual, not within a culture. They obfuscate openly, truth with lies. This is very simple. They'll just tell you black is white, white is black, and it's this way because we said so, because we are the arbiters of truth and we will tell you what is right and what is wrong. We'll make it up as we go along, depending on our objectives and our aims and our goals. So, the truth is what we say it is. It's not something that's out there. It's just all relative, moral relativism again. The truth is what I say it is, because that's what's good for me. Well, that isn't really what truth is. Truth is actually independent of the individual. 
and we need to use our perceptions to get into harmony with it. That's the truth actually exists independent of what we think or feel about it. So that's another method of obfuscation and this is how moral relativism works. Obfuscate the truth with lies. Obfuscate good with evil. Get everybody believing that they can content, they'll continue to do things that really aren't good for them, but they'll end up getting something good out of it. This is the hamster in wheel syndrome. You know, I'll keep doing this and getting one result, but expect to get another result, which I can never get by doing this, but I'll continue to run around in the wheel anyway. See, I, they want you to believe that you can get that which is good by really doing things that are harmful ultimately. You know, and are not in uh, uh, in harmony with nature, in harmony with natural law, in harmony with the truth. So people are really living this here. They're living that which is going to get them that, and they think it's going to get them this. And it'll never work that way. And that's what attachment is all about. Attachment to doing things one way, thinking a certain way, and you expect that somehow magically, even though it's never gotten you what you want, it's going to suddenly get you what you want one day. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way.